This is a reading of the introduction from the Message Volume 1 which is written by Rittikacharya Krishna Prasanna Bhattacharya one of the finest devotees of Purushottam Sri Siddhakura Nukul Chandra. To one whose life is not rooted in the bedrock of love and devotion, the senses are the only prop. A vague thrill of the senses on which he stands and moves is the only flickering of his feeble existence. He often feels an irresistible vacuum that sucks him in. He has nothing to possess him, to enchant him, to engage him, to immerse him. The heart is ever hungry. Such was I, a motherless boy at life's beginning. I had a hardened heart that could only palpitate with the promptings of the senses. I still remember the feverish zeal, the burning fumes rising out of my heated nerves, with which I sacrificed myself at the altar of the senses from the very boyhood. My smouldering self could scarcely dream it was no joy, burning is no pleasure, death can never be life. Thus I grew and grew, and the passions goaded me on. A passionate nature is always keen to penetrate the depths of others' minds. I imbibed all too, dissecting a temperament and analyzed things to their very root. I had a sensuous hunger to drink life to the lees, to see through the mysterious veil of the nature which I could not penetrate. Pathos, an undefined hankering, a burning of the brains haunted me throughout. I had a fervor to know, to melt the mysterious block of hard nature with its wonders of the sky and earth, to rend to shreds the ignorance of man. Radical in the extreme, I was an atheist. Reason could only dictate duties to me. So duties had I none. Like a saw in the carpenter's hand or the cruel knife of a dissector, my mind would tear everything to shreds. Moral dogmas were shop-worn imbecility to me. Obedience, a necessary evil. Faith, a blindness and regard, an inferiority complex. I disowned all traditions to be bosh and nonsense and thus I created a vacuous hollow a vacuous hollow future for me with nothing but lazy fanged ego that could not but that could but gnaw at its own self draw in and quench a hypocritical veil smooth and glossy covered me all around and often the squall of a sensuous urge or the whirl blast of a seething passion would leave me in a miry tedium of a dullness, where the heart parched up and scorched would wildly scream in the wilderness of a sterile repentance. The only escape valve in my hands was to absorb myself in studies and to try to fathom the depths of human ignorance. Life was a hard nut for me to crack. I began to read voluptuously. To me all was thinking and abstracting and imagining, a negative criticism of positive fault-finding. Science came to my aid. The electrons and protons, the quanta of Planck, the relativity of Einstein helped me to visualize the ultimatums of existence. In the non-causal nothingness of the whizzing of ultra atoms. Shankara, Hegel, Kant, Kant, and electrons all made a foggy muddle in my brains and stole away the last remnants of reality in me. Still, I was living, and life cannot but be real. The azure cup of the sky would pour 
in its floody heavenly light on me. The earth with her seasons intruded into my aloofness and enchanted me. The living world was a perennial wonder to my eyes and ears. Man would unconsciously draw sympathy from me and woman was an unwelcome curiosity that would attract me with an unwilling magnetic pull. But a profanity in me would always dissect and debase and pollute the beauties of nature. My passions distorted my normal relations with the surroundings. In spite of me and my mutilated exhausted self would mourn in painful remorse and cry out, where am I? Is this my real self? But what my self is, I could not find out. The vaults of a hollow existence could but echo repentance. I came to the full bloom of youth, yet life was yawning nothingness to me, an incoherent whim-wham of freakful chaos. Ideas were all barren. I was in utter need of something, something to soothe me. I saw Rabindranath, Gandhi, Swami Dayananda, and Thakur Haranath, and many others. I longed for Sri Ramakrishna and Vivekananda. They were dead and gone. I heard of Sri Aurobindo. He attracted me. I was then a professor of physics at Hooghly College and arranged to see him at Pondicherry during the summer. But events suddenly took a new unexpected course. The random reading of a few pages from a Bengali monthly invited my attention. It was a conversation. I resolved to see a man who first could talk so prophetically. He was at Pabna in a village. The day came. I met him. It was a summer dawn. The Padma was flowing on a vast glassy sheet. The sandy banks were pious white, cattle were growing into the fields, and a wild breeze gave a soothing touch of the corning. I landed down, the ferry on the bank, and wended my way with a throbbing heart. Darkness of the night was melting away. There was a sense of familiar all around. I and my friend reached a cluster of cottages in a hamlet. A sudden sound of wooden sleepers, then a familiar touch, a loving arm around my neck, a sweet, low, unhesitating voice. I got the touch of whom I knew not then, but a positive touch of a long separated acquaintance. My mind became disinclined to take exception to such a queer shock of familiarity. My memory can never fail. I still remember the first silent touch of intimacy, the soaring eyes and the easy sympathy, the glow of his smile, the unique harmony and freedom in everything he did. The evening drew near. Underneath a tree was a bamboo scaffold. He was sitting there. The sun was setting. A shower of mellow light fell on his beaming face. He asked me with a smile, Brother, don't you ever like to bow down your head? I retorted, Why would I bow down before a man? He smiled. He lay down on my lap and said in a low tone, I have a pain, a blank hair in the region of my heart. Why? From after the Sincona injection I had to take during a fever, I said. I said, why? Your adherents say you are the Lord, the Redeemer of the world, the world teacher, and you require injections, and you can't cure yourself? How can that be? 
His face beamed. He took the challenge so easily and in a way peculiarly his own pointing out with his fingers the acacia tree before him he said Don't you see the tree before you Just so behold it has a scar on it but it grows and grows upward with the scar on its bosom It could strictly be no answer to my question but it was for somehow i could understand feel realize dimly vaguely but surely that if there be any lord he is intimate with all the sorrow and griefs of the world which are as painful scars on his bosom and he ever goes on and on with them he grew interesting to me we talked on and on the shades of night fell on we could only feel each other i felt like one returning home to the precious silence of his loving guide and friend i talked of science of atoms of electrons of radium of x-rays of quanta of the living and the non-living of heaven and earth and of what not on the breezy summer night under the star glittered canopy of the sky the padma was lashing her waves on her bank i poured out my brains i could not but do so i found in him a loving responding receptacle of all the questionings and absurdities in me like one meeting his asked for after a long separation i had all my valves open my brakes were off i laughed with him kept silent for long with his head on my lap both gazing at the same stars in the same sky rang with him talks on all topics and there was an overwhelming response from him sympathetic retorts unique suggestions and queries i wondered how one who has i knew was not initiated into academic culture could understand so profoundly and respond with such intelligent keenness his utterances were so homely so intelligent so delicate so nice so living so enlightening so very concordant with the later discoveries of the science and suggestive of new avenues of thought and work yet so nakedly simple i doubted and asked how can you talk of these things of electrons of quanta surely you have read of these things he answered no from my childhood i sometimes see the universe all melting into a glow of ineffable light particles and the light condenses and condenses into the material objects surrounding me his utterances burst out like eruptions volcanic but sweet they were rough hewn expressions of sensations so immediate so real so ab- absorbing i vaguely apprehended he can see the sciences he can perceive the ultra atoms the next day i felt and i left him with reluctance my pretensions of knowledge got a rude shock from him who has no university education and cannot even speak in english i again met him soon at calcutta and kept his company for months his vivid description of the ultimate of physical nature did not only tally with the present day science but suggested new lines of research which were so brilliantly original and prolific to me and to most of my scientist friends that i soon gave up the work i began with professor c v raman at the palit laboratories calcutta university and joined him in his cottage home the words of max planck rang in my ears quote scientists will arise who will have much keener perception 
than the scientists of today. What we need to develop are the perceptive faculties themselves. The development of the powers of perception is one of the main tasks we have to meet. That seems to be Einstein's idea." Unquote. And that idea I saw realized in him, in his queer visions. But above all I found in him a lover, a friend, a guide, redeemers of an atheist like me. On this my friends gave up all hopes of me and had grave suspicious and suspicion about my sanity. Days and years rolled on in his company as if in a sweet but active dream. I soon gathered his past life from him, his mother, his villagers, his relations and adherents. My pen cannot do the least justice to his life, so varied and eventful. Born in 1888, from his very childhood, he was a favorite and wonder of all. His mother, relatives and playmates were often taken aback by his deep insight into the spirit of man and nature. His love for from early childhood worked miracle amongst his associates. He would penetrate and perceive things so deeply and directly with his quick senses that mysteries unraveled before his eyes in all their details from his very boyhood. He had many interesting visions and many a time in the effulgence of the light which penetrated his whole being, he would swoon away for which his mother suspected him to have the sacred sickness. He would often perceive the whole universe around him melting into the tremors of light which would speak, could transmit thrills of a celestial music. The heavenly light and sound in incarnated themselves into tangible things, the trees, the plants, the beings and the earth below him. Struck with wonder, he could again descend from his being of light and sound into the solid world of flesh and blood. In an ecstasy of joy, he would rush forward to embrace the luminous glow and the hard solid things would knock against him. Thus one with the universe, he could not but love his surroundings. He felt them part and parcel of his own self. Overwhelmed with a spontaneous love and sympathy for all, his youth swelled in dance and music on the banks of the Padma, captivating all by his emotions and fervent zeal. None could resist his supreme charm. During these days of dance and music, he would become unconscious of his body. His system gave no responses to any stimulus. His heart stopped its beatings, sometimes for hours together, and his flushing face became radiant with a heavenly glow when brilliant sayings came out of his lips to utter wonder and astonishment of all. People would flock in numbers. Everyone felt the shock of his sayings and the sweet melody of his voice trembling with the holy messages would reverberate in one's heart long after one left his company. During these periods of trance, he would speak sometimes in a sweet commanding voice, peculiarly his own. Frequent repetitions of such states and the extraordinary sayings of the being and becoming of humanity at large and the universe especially attracted people from all parts of the country. Only for 71 days during these holy trances could be recorded. Still, he was all human, a simple son deeply devoted to his mother. He read at high school at Pabna but could not matriculate. The depraved teachings in the schools could but grieve a genius like him out of their precincts. He went to Calcutta to learn the medical science but returned without any diploma to his village 
practice as a physician. He worked miracles as a physician. Rumors spread he could revive the dead, but the physician was compelled with the pressure of circumstances to minister unto the minds diseased. Many came to be cured of their disease, but ultimately turned into his followers. From the time I saw him, he was quite homely. The trances were no more. Under the shade of the acacia trees, on the bank of the Padma or in the homely cottages, we would keep his company for hours together, morning, noon and night. We would talk on philosophy, on sociology, on politics, on education, on economics, on the medical sciences. His touching remarks like a searchlight swept over the heaven and earth and penetrated into the depths of existence. We talked of the world old and new, past and present, and got glimpses of the future that is to come. We thought rather experienced together. The first touch of faith and regards wields a magic wand and opens the secrets of life. New vistas of necessities, new appreciation and fresh activities. And the resultant of all this is character. His adherents were unknowingly forming their characters and crystallized round the central figure, their Thakur or the Lord as they called him. The days and years were merry-go-rounds of new thinking, new adjustment and intimate living a digging to the foundations of being and gave us aids of higher light. The subtler depths of humanity stirred into new inventions to fulfill it. It was no call of hatred or hunger. It was a naked call for love for Thakur, a living tremendously dynamic like that of Padma flowing before us. We grew in number. Many came to catch a glimpse of the unique state of trance of our young Thakur. Rumors spread far and wide, seekers after truth poured in numbers, scientists, philosophers, educationists, reformers, the poor and the rich, young and the old followed into the village, where he, where, where, and were impressed with the manifold genius of this queer personality. The village homestead of the young physician soon turned into a society, a colony of friends and followers. Many of us, his disciples, settled here permanently. Slowly life grew in this secluded hamlet. Necessity sprang up. Thakur suggested starting educational homes for the boys and girls of the inmates and he himself worked and begged for funds. Huts were created or erected. Tapovan, the educational home. Students from different parts of the country began pouring in. Once Thakur playfully asked one of our brethren for funds to start a scientific research laboratory. It was absurd, I thought to start a science laboratory here in the backward in such a backward village. We could then scarcely have two meals a day. But soon it, it came into shape. Jungles were cut down and building with up-to-date apparatus and fittings now stand in, in this village with scientists to work therein. Slowly and steadily the powerhouse with oil engines and dynamics, the mechanical workshop, the chemical works, the art studio, the engineering works have been started and scientific industries have been growing in this remote hamlet of Bengal against heavy odds. Various new medicines have been invented from indigenous herbs and all by the zeal and skill of one man. Dreams have been transmuted into living reality, imagination into solid facts, thoughts materialized irrevocably within flesh and blood. 
what was once a dreary corner of a primitive village has turned into a busy beehive of modern complex activities. The colony now rings with life and thought and a culture, a coordinated educational, economic, social and industrial activity in harmony with the existential needs and spiritual hankering of humanity at large. A sure testimony to the constructive genius of the organizer who is mingled with the origin and details of every work in every department here in the most homely fashion. Every child, every boy, every girl, every individual here, young or old, male or female, is in intimate touch with Thakur. He knows of their confessions, their wants, their hankerings and molds them accordingly towards a superior becoming, each in his original way. Thus he has created the seeds of various institutions that go on in to build up an ideal nation springing out of the necessities of his country's life. The loving Thakur I saw a decade back has become the founder of Satsang with branches in Bengal, Burma, Bihar and Assam and with thousands of followers under the banner of his faith. Yet, he's the same self-humble and homely gentleman, still with the naked simplicity of a Bengali villager. A devoted son to his beloved mother, a loving husband, a dutiful father, an affectionate brother, and a perfect friend and guide to all. Visitors pour in every day in numbers, Indians and Europeans, to see him and his peaceful, silent, active home. With no funds he began, and still aspires to develop and spread newer and newer activities for the being and becoming of humanity at large. He is the slogan of love, life and service. When the late Deshbundhu Chitranjan Dash approached him at Calcutta and a, a few years before his sudden demise and accepted him as his spiritual guide, Thakur said, I know of no other politics. If service to necessities of man is politics, then I am politician to my backbone. I understand love. I appreciate what service is. I love life, not death. He can repair men like motor cars in the hands of an expert engineer, and the nervous, debilitated and imbecile bloom in health and vigor if they have the sincerity to keep his company for some times. With a few strokes of his chisel, he can create life and energy in a block of a lifeless man. The hopeless beam with hope, the weak quiver with thrills of energy, unfelt before and the depressed become inspired with his slogan of love, life and lift. His life drama is played, not in the stirring fields of politics, not in the superficies of the masses, nor on the platform. He works smilingly in the depths of the human soul with his unvulnerable love, service and activity and can arouse the dreams of a Caesar in the heart of a Bengali and the inspiration of a Joan of Arc, Joan of Arc in the soft flickerings of a Bengali illiterate woman's heart. Thakur says, The earth is full of agonies of the civilized can't you hear the clang of the weapons of love and service, India's birthright of becoming? My war is a war of services against the foes common to all, the poor and the rich, the East and the West. Have you not the nerves and the pluck to attack the citadels of ignorance and prejudice, the hosts visible and invisible? that brings in disease, disaster, sufferings and death? He has a full 
and definite program for individuals and nation. For all those who aspire for freedom, yet unrealized in its truest sense by man. I see every day for the last 12 years, the poor and the uncultured find in him their food and hope and prop. The Hindus come and accept him as the living ideal of Aryan culture. The Mohammedans follow Muhammad more truly when they feel the touch of our Thakur's living regard for their Prophet. The Christians cannot but love him as they feel their Jesus is more deeply in his company. A Christian missionary from Australia once came and said, If our Christ would have come at this hour, he would surely, under the exigencies of the modern times, serve the humanity exactly in the way your Thakur has been doing here. If the world progress, as Rector Hermann Neander of Sweden says, waits for religious unity, Thakur is giving his little pushes and responses to the cries of the world from his remote corner of Bengal. From the seed through from the seed through an experimental seed only, he has been growing in one of the most weedy corners of Bengal against the queer of oppositions of a peculiarly hostile environment. Visitors call him in Lenin with no massacre and hatred. Others call him a non-violent Mussolini advancing to a balanced and organized social order for national rebirth. A magistrate from a local district says his philosophy to be a queer harmony of Bergson and Eucan. Some say he is a Pythagoras in his visions. Others see him Socrates with his characteristics powers of converse, conversation. Some compare him with Swedenborg the prince of mystics. Others see in him a socio-religious Hitler with no dream of bloodshed. World tourists consider his ashram to be the very finest example of self-improvement and self-control seen in any part of the world. Yet many of his relatives, villagers and countrymen out of ignoble jealousy call an imposter and his mission to be a materialistic jugglery of religion for profiteering to deceive and misguide the ignorant and the young. But to us, he is ever the simple loving Thakur, a Bengali to the core, entwined with the tiny sorrows and happenings of our life. We can only repent, we cannot do the least justice to materialize the innumerable suggestions we receive from him and can't repay the least bit of the love and life he showers on us. Practical in the extreme, he has a dreamy distance in his sucking lustrous eyes and a heavenly smile in his lips that none can fathom. He writes nothing but letters in his life. He has occasionally given answers to the questions asked by people from different parts of India and abroad. <clears throat> he can convince in a minute. His utterances, as they are always intensely personal, to remove the burdens of the heart or to solve problems, have almost evaporated. Only a few have been recorded and have gone through the past and also the press, printing press. <coughs> he cannot speak in any language but his own. A few months back during the last winter, I asked of him some sayings in English for the English knowing people. Some of his latest utterances in Bengali were recorded and have recently been published. I thought if such utterances were in English, they might be of interest to a greater number of people. I cannot now fully understand how I could at all request him to say something in English knowing full well for the last decade he does not know the language. Thakur only smiled and said, Absurd. A few days passed by. One evening he called and asked me to write down. I was taken aback. 
suddenly he began to dictate in English. My pen trembled as it wrote. For days together he called me off and on and gave out his utterances. There were many of us present during the time. Visitors would sometime intervene and go away. The workers of our satsang would come in gushes and I could not in a hurry find time to write them down. As Thakur himself says, the sayings rise in his mind all on a sudden, quite unaware, like shoals of fishes in the sea or lumps of clouds in the sky, and as suddenly they disappear. I used to talk with him on different topics and asked him questions. I began to attend him most of the time he kept awake during the day and night as I could scarcely know when Thakur would call me. The utterances were a shock of wonder to me. Never did I hear him speak out a full sentence in English for the last twelve years or more. I have been living with him. These were waking trances, as some would say. He would most of the time lie down in his bed and talk with us. There is not a single utterance in the collection from the very first to the last. In his ideas on religion, spiritualism, education, society, money, industry and commerce and others, which has not been evolved out of his personal realization and experiences and which he has not been trying to materialize in the scale of a seedling there in the satsang. The life of Thakur, like the alpine glacier which melts into an infinity of colors as it proceeds onwards, has been breaking into a variety of channels, each solving the problems of a particular phase of human necessity. He himself knows in what a sea of bliss for mankind his life will find its consummation. The sayings gave a clear solution to my questions on the different problems of the present day world. To me, at least, for whom they were intended. Can they be of any interest and values to others? I showed them to some of my friends. Most of the pieces were excellent to them. I showed them to Rev. Dr. Arkwat, ex-Vice-Chancellor of Calcutta University. He went, to, went through all of the sayings and said, most of the pieces are so interesting, so nice, so charming, such brilliant ideas, and wrote to me, I have looked at the verses and aphorisms with much interest and appreciate the elevated thoughts. I hope the book, will, when printed, will serve the purpose for which it is intended. I resolved to print them and the name message occurred to my mind. I supplied headings to the different sayings and have broken the sentences exactly as they were in the original into different lines to faithfully reproduce the rhythm and stresses and the kazura in the utterances of Thakur. If they be of any the least help to any of my careworn brothers as they have been to me if my brethren read them with sympathy and dive into the essence of the sayings remembering with consideration there may be the many faults of omission and commission during my writing and if the message of Thakur can shed the least light on the darkness in their minds and imbue them with hope and energy in the gloomy unsolved parts of their lives, I shall deem it with gratitude, a fervor, a reward, a mercy from him, the beloved, who is omnipotent through the zeal of his burning love for all, omnipresent for his weirdly responding sympathy for the universe, who is, who is unmistakably the creator for which the short touch of his love and light, he ever moves the instincts of the forlorn like me. Yet a personality, human in the extreme, the son of man in flesh and blood, through whom, in whom and with whom 
we eternally fulfill ourselves and become sons of God. Krishna Prasanna Bhattacharya Satsang Pabna, January 1935